welcome. I'm Halise Lieberman, the director of the Toby Center here in Warsaw. We appreciate that you have joined us for this special edition of TJHT Talks in partnership with Sky Heritage Pictures as we commemorate the 76th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. We call to mind one of the six million. Gideon Klein was the son of Yindrich and Ilona, brother of Edith and Eliska. He was born in the Czech Republic in 1919. Gideon was a gifted pianist, a promising composer, a prisoner first in Theresienstadt and then in Auschwitz where he was murdered on the day of liberation. This program will include a film followed by a brief conversation between our scholars, Dr. Tomasz Sabulski and Dr. David Flig. If you have questions, we will share their contact information with you in our follow-up email. I now invite Dr. Tomasz Sabulski, a friend and colleague who often serves as our scholar in residence, to share his research and his film. Tomasz is an independent scholar with a doctorate in political studies from Jagiellonian University in Krakow and the author of the book Auschwitz After Auschwitz. Tomasz's life's, life's passion, in addition to scholarship, has become guiding and genealogical research. The pandemic inspired him to take up filmmaking to promote the status, interpretation, and research of Polish Jewish heritage sites. Tomasz. Uh, welcome, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Felice, for this uh, uh, introduction. Um, I feel in depth in your friendship and the fact that you are accommodating us with this program today. Uh, I also have fresh in mind the events exactly last year this time uh, when we've all met in a tent built over the gate of Birkenau uh, with close to 300 survivors in one place. Uh, taking into consideration what is happening now, probably that was the last event of this kind happening. And uh, each and every of those people with us was bringing in their own memory of the Holocaust, but at the same time as a group, uh, they were actually a certain remaining foundation of the global memory of the Holocaust as we know it. Uh, I strongly believe that the pandemic that is happening shall absolutely not stop us in our active memory. And um, in order to continue with uh, memory itself, and I strongly believe that memory is constituting us, constituting our identity, and defining us, but defining us on a daily basis, defining us in relation to social events and political events that are happening. Uh, so uh, I would like to continue, thank you, thanks to your support, the tradition of the anniversaries of Auschwitz liberation. And we do it on the eve of the International Day of Remembrance of the Holocaust. Uh, I would like to thank also each and every person in the audience today with us, uh, because we are gathering here in unity in order to commemorate Gideon Klein. So let me just introduce the premiere of a film, which I was involved in producing two weeks for the last two weeks. Uh, the title is Auschwitz Fürstengrube Liberation Without Freedom. How large was Auschwitz? How vast, both geographically and figuratively, we understand the words of Auschwitz-Birkenau today. The German Nazis started the Kampf immediately after they took this part of southern Poland. This part of southern Poland of former, well, Eastern Silesia or Upper Silesia was almost immediately included into the Third Reich in October of 1939 
and uh, the plan was obvious from the very beginning. It needs to be redeveloped, it needs to be invested into, and at first this was not necessarily Wehrmacht or SS investing their money. There were dozens of German companies. The companies we know today, which were investing their money in this region with uh, hope for profit. Uh, such was the case in the place we are standing. We are in Auschwitz, although we are 14 kilometers north of Auschwitz proper as we know it. In September of 1943, it was known as Auschwitz Furstengrube, one of the largest out of 48 of German Nazi satellite camps of Auschwitz. Uh, the camp of Furstengrube was uh, accommodating in 1944 at the peak of its development uh, around 1,200 of inmates, mostly Jews, from various countries of Europe. We are right now standing on the very outskirts of a camp which was built specifically to hold the inmates of Auschwitz. This camp was built by inmates themselves. You can see the corner, the relatively solid brick fencing. On the topping of this brick fencing, you can see this very characteristic concrete band pillars. On each of the four corners of the camp, there were four pretty tall watchtowers that uh, German Nazis built in order to supervise those inmates here. So, being 14 kilometers from Auschwitz as we know it, we are still in Auschwitz. But, we can go another 50, 60 kilometers west of here, as far as, for example, Gliwice, and we would still be in Auschwitz. You need to remember that in this relatively short time period from the camp establishment, in spring of 1940 till the camp of liberation in January of 45, the German Nazis, but not necessarily the Nazis only, the German industry in search for profit established one of the largest system of exploitation of slave labor force that was known to humanity. In late of 1944, when the camp is about to be liberated, the camp of Auschwitz, the larger camp of Auschwitz, is holding close to 130, 140,000 of inmates who are still alive just for one reason. They are an economic asset. They are representing a slave labor force for either the private enterprises in the vicinity of Auschwitz or for the SS itself, which at certain point is starting to consolidate its labor force for its own purposes. In July of 1943, the management of uh, IG Fahrbahn is inviting the commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hoess, into the territory for an inspection. This is the decision about establishment of Auschwitz Furstengrube. The first inmates are coming in September 1943. The commandant is becoming the known Auschwitz Sadis Otto Moll, a later person responsible for the operation of gas chambers and crematoriums in Birkenau. 
All of those inmates are building the new and operating the old Furstengruber coal mine in the vicinity of the camps. But there is also Lager Sud existing earlier for the Italian and Ukrainian women, Lager Valdek with a couple of hundreds of Soviet prisoners of war. There's also Lager Nord with Polish, Greek, Belgium, French prisoners. And somewhere in the middle of this human exploitation misery, there is a forest cemetery for the regular burials of those who are falling victims of industrial exploitation in Fürstengrube. We are about half a mile north of Auschwitz-Furstengrube in a forest. It's a very surreal place. It was organized first as a cemetery in 1941 to bury all of those compulsory workers that were dying in performing the slave labor force for German industry in this part of Silesia. So mostly from Camp Waldeck, Camp Nord and Camp South. Then when Fürstengrube as a part of Auschwitz was established, it became also a place of burial of some of the inmates that died during the slave labor in the Fürstengrube mine. Officially those who died within the camp were stored in the morgue and then their corpses were being taken 14 kilometers south into the crematoriums of Birkenau but we do know that there were a lot of corpses buried here in this very cemetery because local peasants were forced into transportation of corpses almost daily. We know today that the mortality in Furstengrube, only in Furstengrube Auschwitz, was about two free people a day, from September 43 till January 45. But later on, under the Communist administration, this part of Poland, remained within a large system of labor camps. So uh, there were a lot of local Silesia population, Germans, POWs, that were stationed and imprisoned in Kampfustengrube and worked in the coal mines. Their cemetery was organized on top of those that were buried within 40s. Life, slave labor and death in Furstengrube is described in a large number of testimonies and relations which were collected right after the war. Some of them as early as 1945-46 by the prosecutors who are collecting data for the trials of the camp commandant Rudolf Hess. We have a couple of testimonies collected by the Polish head prosecutor Jan Zen interviewing the survivors of Furstengrube. But also, there are many testimonies collected by the workers of the later established State Museum Auschwitz-Birkenau, who were trying to collect as much data and evidence from not only inmates, but also local population who witnessed those atrocities. Let us get to the relation of a French-Jewish prisoner, a musician himself, by the name of Felix Stahl, in which he's trying to describe the labor conditions in such camps. In the camps where there were coal mines, the work was very hard. It was the worst kind of work I can imagine. 
prisoners worked in three shifts, eight hours each. It was very wet in the pits and the footwear of the prisoners was often torn to pieces and many of them had to walk with wet feet, with resulting serious sicknesses. Many of the pits were only 70 centimeters high, so that the prisoners had to walk lying on their stomachs and kneeling. Eight hours in such a posture with hardly any interval, and the blows beside them made themselves felt. We were slaves. The coal shovel was at least four times as big as a normal shovel. Many prisoners lost their lives by being buried under collapsing passages or by having their heads crushed by falling lamps or coal and debris. Naturally, the men had to wash themselves and return from the mines. This was no pleasure, since even in the extreme cold, the men had to undress out of the doors and then await their turn. Only a few of them had towels. Thus the majority had to run, shivering and wet, back to the barracks. Frequently the prisoners, upon their return, tired and hungry, as they were, had first to engage in half an hour's sport, perhaps merely for not having sung efficiently loudly while marching camp wards. We're standing in a, here at the very important border. It's a border in between a concentration camp behind us and a death camp in front of us. So we may actually make a statement that uh, it's a border of a certain German Nazi planning mistake in setting up Auschwitz. A mistake of self-incriminating themselves, conducting the mass extermination in the crematoriums and gas chambers in the back of Birkenau in the full visibility of dozens of thousands of inmates that are performing labor on a daily basis. Of course the perpetrators are absolutely not anticipating that some of those people may survive, that some of those people may become the witnesses. In the German Nazi planning of this place they are building the eternal Third Reich, so they are planning to be here forever. The camp is built very solid, they are using the best construction materials they can specifically for the construction of the crematoriums and gas chambers which were in the back part of Birkenau. Somewhere behind us is a ruin of crematorium gas chamber number three. The largest piece of technology that humanity ever invented and built for the sake of mass extermination of human beings. A piece of technology which was used from spring of 1943 into the late of 1944 to mass exterminate the European Jewish community. But we are exactly in the place where the hospital building was located. And as we are here on the anniversary of liberation of Auschwitz, uh, this place is important for the moment of liberation. We know that the camp was evacuated, just like all of the other camps of Auschwitz complex, in uh, mid-January of 1945. This meant about uh, eight to nine thousands of inmates being marched towards Gliwice. So they were marching for about 45 kilometers in a critical winter January conditions. Then in Gliwice, they were put into open air freight cars and taken into a long journey into Mauthausen, 
those who survived, and we're estimating about 25% of those pushed into the death marches would not were liberated only a couple of months later. Yes, ironically, the liberation of Auschwitz of the 27th of January 45 did not mean freedom for most of the Auschwitz inmates. On the contrary, over 50,000 of them were organized in marching columns. In case of here, Fürstengrube, we get personal accounts of the nearby villages and inhabitants who give us specific descriptions. The inmates were put into a roll call square inside of Fürstengrube, and then a line of inmates of four in a row was created. We have accounts of the inmates in the external row having their hands tied with a rope into a kind of a long stick making an external barrier so that the inmates are not running and in such a mode they are being taken walking into Gliwice, 45 kilometers walk. But there were also those inmates who stayed behind. There were also those inmates who stayed within the camp of Furstengrube and they stayed here. They stayed here in the hospital barrack. About 250 men, mostly Jews, quite a lot of them from the transport arriving in October of 1944 from Theresienstadt, among them Gideon Klein and Schorsch. So there's 250 men that were left in the hospital barrack. They were too terrified to leave the camp fences. They were trying to organize some kind of a camp life in the critical winter conditions. And then, on the 27th of January, 1945, the official date of liberation of Auschwitz, there was a Wehrmacht unit that was operating behind the evacuation line. This Wehrmacht unit was actually sent to Birkenau with a specific task, to explode the crematoriums and gas chambers, or the empty shells of the buildings of crematoriums, gas chambers number two, Three, four, and five. As this unit was obviously evacuating direction west on the 27th, because they've exploded the last crematorium on the 26th of January, as this unit was retreating west, they must have went through here, through Furstengrube. They encountered those 250 men in a barrack, and they've organized a massacre here. We have a lot of accounts of the local population of what had happened. We know that the camp of Furstengrube was surrounded with a kind of a military cordon and the building of hospital was set on fire. We also have accounts of the Wehrmacht soldiers shooting at those who were trying to escape. This is the way how Gideon Klein and 200 other men would die on the 27th of January of 1945. So thank you very much. Thank you for sharing the movie and thank you for watching the movie. Um, this movie would never be created if it wouldn't be for the fact that uh, eight years ago I've, made, I've met uh, Dr. David Flick, who became a friend over time. Um, Dr. Flick is a UK musicologist. Uh, he's an expert in music from Theresienstadt prison, camp and ghetto. Um, and he's also an expert on the life of Gideon Klein. 
He's a honorary research fellow at the Royal Norton College of Music uh, and visiting professor at Chester University. His biography of Klein, Letter uh, from Gideon, was recently, two years ago, if I remember correctly, published in Czech Republic. And it's about to be published in English version shortly. It will be released by Takata Press, most likely this year. So um, I would like to welcome um, Dr. Klein. Uh, hello. Nice to see you, David. And thank you for being here with us today. And I was thinking about this, uh, marking this event of the anniversary and uh, kind of the first thought coming to my mind was the time we spent in, in the Furstein group eight years ago. Uh, and as I said, without you, we would have never been there today. Uh, so thank you for your research and publishing the book. Um, just a couple of questions, particularly about Gideon because we are interested in his story today. Uh, can you tell us a few words, who was Gideon Klein and what were his inspirations? What was his life before the war in Czech Republic? Well, firstly, that, that's a, a big question to, uh, to answer in a, a short space of time, but let me be uh, as brief as possible. Um, firstly, Gideon Klein was, was known in pre-war Prague and in the early days of the occupation as a, as a pianist, uh, although he was very young, uh, he was making a name for himself as a pianist and he was also composing. But in many ways, the compositions, and we'll get on to talking about that, that in, in, a, in a short while, but the compositions were sort of a, a private venture for him. As far as we're aware, none of the compositions that he wrote in Prague were ever publicly performed. But he was known as a pianist and he was making a great name for himself there. But uh, back in his uh, hometown of Cherov in, uh, in Moravia, um, he came from a very traditional uh, Jewish family. They were fairly assimilated, but they marked the, the main Jewish festivals. They were um, fiercely proud of their, of their Jewish heritage. Uh, they were committed Zionists as well. And um, I would say that uh, Gideon's chief influence was on his mother's side. The family was called Marmerstein. They were arty, they were liberal, they were politically savvy. Um, they, they knew what was going on in the world, whereas the Klein side, they were, they were business people. His grandfather, Emmanuel Klein, he was a, a hard-nosed a, a hard businessman. So it's very interesting to, to uh, when I was researching the, the clashes between the two families. And I have to say that until I started re researching about Gideon, hardly anything was known about his childhood in Cherov, and very little was known about his activities in Prague before the war. Uh, and his musical influences the classics, uh, Mozart was his god, for example. He always said that um, when someone once asked him, where did you learn music? And he said, I learned music at Mozart. Thank you very much. So he, um, in spite of a young age, he seemed to be a pretty accomplished artist in the 30s. And, uh, and then come the 30s. Uh, where everything changes uh, in Czech Republic. And the question is whether he does have the sense of threat of the late 30s, whether he is looking for some opportunities of uh, leaving Czech Republic. Uh, what is his reaction or his artistic reaction to the political developments of the Munich Agreement and the subsequent disappearance of Czech Republic? Because in the life of a young man, uh, this is a major change. Uh, so what I'm probably trying to ask here is um, whether he's reacting and what are those visible symptoms of um, approaching catastrophe, which today we know turn into genocide. But uh, the question is whether the people in those circumstances have a chance of seeing the symptoms. And I would say the artists have a special sense of seeing the symptoms early, earlier than the normal people. Um, he reacted he responded on a practical level, and I'll talk about that. But he also reacted in a, on an artistic level as well. And by artistic level, in that we, we find in the music that he was writing, 
And even in the performances, this element of, how can we describe it, um, spiritual defiance, if you like, artistic defiance. So firstly, on a practical level, his family, his mother and his, uh, his sister, they try, to, they try to get him out of Czechoslovakia. And in fact, he was offered a place to study at the Royal, uh, at the Royal Academy of Music in London commencing in September 1940. Uh, and, um, you know, they got testimonials and uh, some people, some sources say that he even got a scholarship to go to London. I haven't found any evidence of a scholarship, but nonetheless, he was offered this place to study in London. Um, but of course it was too late. The borders were already closed. And one of the things which uh, I think is important to understand is that very soon after the German occupation of Czechoslovakia, of Bohemia and Moravia, uh, and of Prague in particular, um, the, the Germans started to really rule that region uh, with an iron fist. And in particular for the Jews, the Nuremberg laws, which had been impl implemented uh, throughout the Third Reich, were implemented uh, in Czechoslovakia as well. And so more and more freedoms were, were being put, put on, on, on the Jews. Gideon found it impossible to leave. And obviously he was well aware of, of the situation that he was living under occupation. So I'll give you an example of what he did and how he reacted uh, in his music. Firstly, um, eventually in early 1940, the universities, colleges, uh, higher education institutions were, were closed down. So that put paid to his studies at the Prague Conservatory. Um, but also uh, Jews were then forbidden to go to colleges or universities in any case. Uh, two of his teachers, his musicology teacher, Josef Hutter, and his composition teacher, Alois Haber, uh, they taught him secretly, actually. And we owe a great debt to them for, for making sure that Gideon received that wonderful education, that it continued. He could no longer perform in public. The Jews weren't able to perform in public. And so he took upon himself a pseudonym. He called himself Karel Vranek. And under that pseudonym, he performed a few concerts. Of course, everybody at the concerts knew who he was in any case, because Gideon was well known on the music scene. But nonetheless, the concert was advertised as being performed by Karel Branek. But as I say, it was short lived. Uh, he um, continued to compose. Uh, and to give you just a couple of examples of what he was doing, and this is this is really interesting and it's key to our understanding of how Gideon was responding to the situation. In April 1940, he completes a divertimento for wind instruments. And in it, he quotes from a piece by Janicek. And the piece is from the diary of one who disappeared. Now, I think that is immensely potent. Who's disappeared? Well, in a sense, Gideon felt that Gideon Klein had disappeared. He couldn't even use his own name, you know. So that, that is really telling us something. And in the same piece, he quotes from this um, Czech hymn, uh, Ye Who Are Warriors of God. And it was used by quite a lot of composers, uh, not just at that time, but, but uh, during the previous 100, 200 years, and it was an act of defiance, you know, it's sort of this Czech nationalistic hymn, if you like. Summer 1940, he composes three songs for voice and piano, Czech translations of German texts. In other words, he's sort of reclaiming German literature, but in the Czech translations. And these are songs which talk about darkness encroaching, uh, talk, talks about, um, uh, a solitary environment as well. Uh, 
he writes just on the cusp of war, a melodrama for, for narrator and piano called Topol, the poplar tree. And at the end of it, he writes, those were good times. In other words, when I started writing the piece, they were good times, but not anymore. So there's all sorts of ways in which he was responding to it uh, artistically and also on a practical level. Thank you very much. This, this uh, concept and example of disappearance is, is very telling here in this circumstance because uh, in all kinds of cases of totalitarian regimes, we have the experience of uh, the citizens disappearing. Uh, first, uh, uh, the rights are disappearing, then uh, they are being marked, and then there's a physical disappearance at a certain point. And uh, usually when this physical disappearance arrives, uh, people are turning a blind eye and uh, nobody really reacts. And this is also something that happened to, to Gideon Klein because uh, he's disappearing from Prague in December of 1941, becoming one of the first inmates of uh, Theresienstadt to be. And uh, what do we know about this point of his, uh, him being arrested and him being deported to Theresienstadt and what kind of a level of shock he's going through uh, encountering the reality of Theresienstadt? Um, the whole story of uh, Theresienstadt, Theresien, is well documented. As, as far as Gideon's early days there, um, there was very little. And uh, in, in so many instances in my researches on Gideon Klein, trying to put his life together, you know, I was sort of acting as a, as a Sherlock Holmes type detective, trying to, trying to find the clues and so forth. So what we know is that he wasn't so much arrested and taken to Terezin, um, but he was summoned. And he was summoned as part of this uh, Aufbau Commando, as it was known, or this um, construction workers detail. And these were young Prague-based Jews, largely, uh, who were told to report and they were taken to Terezin. And it was their job to get the camp ready for the influx of prisoners, which would soon follow. Uh, they were told, um, this was uh, early December, I think he, he got his summons in late November. Um, and, um, he was told, they were all told, you'll be home for Christmas. Well, he wasn't home for Christmas. He never saw home again. You'll be able to write regularly to your family and friends back home, and they'll be able to write to you. The reality is, I found no evidence that any of Gideon's letters got through to Prague or any of his family's letters got through to Terezin. Maybe they did. If they did, they no, they no longer exist. Um, but um, he arrives in Terezin on the 4th of December. Two days later, he celebrates his 22nd birthday. We can imagine the sense of isolation that he must have felt uh, at that moment in time. Um, he never saw home again. And as part of this construction detail, he ended up being a labourer. You know, they had to get the barracks ready and so forth. And so this, you know highly refined pianist, this wonderfully talented person who had been using his hands to make music, was now using his hands as part of a construction detail. Well, thank you very much for those insights. And uh, uh, a part of the disappearance, I mean, when you analyze the, the life of Gideon Klein, it's, uh, you can see the gradual devouring and devastating power of the totalitarian system um, in which the victims like Gideon are um, being sent through the stages towards the, the genocide. And, uh, and the stages are always repetitive, the radicalization of language, the propaganda, the labeling, the um, deprivation of rights, uh, and then this gradual disappearance. So uh, being sent somewhere for labor, being promised something, and then the next stages. Uh, for Gideon, the next stage of the Theresienstadt, and he has been in Theresienstadt, as I said, as one of the longest uh, prisoners in there, uh, from uh, December of 1941 till October of 1944. 
for Gideon, the next stage is uh, encountering with the vicious circle of Auschwitz. So he is deported in um, probably one of the last transports from Theresienstadt. So what do we know about this point, uh, especially that it's a very late point in history when um, any kind of information flow is almost non-existent. But, uh, but I know that uh, thanks to your research eight years ago, uh, you managed to establish some facts, uh, particularly researching on the territory of Auschwitz. Mm. Um, it's worthwhile just backtracking as well to see what led up to that point in, in Gideon's, uh, in Gideon's uh, experiences, because what has to be understood is that Terezin was a very, very strange phenomenon. And not only was it very strange, but what took place there and why it took place is hugely complicated. Uh, and I think that quite often it's misunderstood because people believe that it was simply a show camp. There was a huge amount of artistic activity there. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was run as sort of this semi-autonomous ghetto. Um, but in actual fact, the reasons for that are quite complicated for the, for the, for the cultural life uh, in Terezin. So if we can imagine that from, uh, let's say, um, 1942, the spring of 1942, through to the spring and summer of 1944, there was this incredible flowering of artistic activity in Terezin, and the SS allowed that to continue for all sorts of complicated reasons, which we can't get into at the moment or else we'll be here for the next five hours, you know. Um, but then eventually that stopped. And so that was sort of something for Gideon to hold on to, that he was at the heart of all that cultural activity. He was in charge, for example, of organizing all the instrumental music concerts as well. Um, so he was absolutely at the heart of it. He was one of the, he was one of the prominente, as, as there were known, uh, people in, in Terezin. But yet it didn't save him from being deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau. So we come on to, to your question there. And um, he was deported on the 16th of October, 1944, one of the last transports to leave. There were these 12 massive transports uh, leaving almost in succession from September through to October, um, a thousand or more prisoners on them. They went east, they went to Auschwitz. Um, Gideon didn't know what would have awaited him. All he knew that he was going east. So he didn't know he was going to an extermination camp. But he leaves uh, Terezin on that date. And then on the 18th of October, he arrives in uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. And um, we know you and I did some, some uh, research uh, ourselves, didn't we? And we we ascertained that he arrived in block 22 of what was the so-called gypsy camp, uh, since vacated, of course, by the time he got there, with, uh, with all the other, uh, with a lot of the other young male Czech prisoners on his transport. And we think he spent maybe a night there, probably two nights, no more. He was processed. And then he was sent the 15 miles or so to uh, Auschwitz Fürstengruber to the sub to the to the sub camp there, uh, and uh, he went. He, he was in the um, Auschwitz part of Fürstengruber, you know that that sub sub camp, uh, and that's when the details about what happened to to Gideon um, become, on the one hand, sketchy, but also. Uh, intriguing and heartbreaking in equal measure. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, he's, uh, when this transport arrives uh, um, into Birkenau, 
uh, this is pretty much the point at which the camp is already engaged in the in the evacuation mode of uh, Auschwitz Birkenau. So the camp administration already accepted the evacuation plan and they are step by step uh, in the realization of uh, the camp disappearance. So they are in realization of another stamp uh, station of a genocide development, which means denial. And they are trying to deny the existence of evidence. Uh, they are trying to make the prisoners, especially those who witnessed uh, disappear uh, but yet there comes a transport and those young men are being still viewed by the other part of what was Auschwitz as labor force, as something that you can exploit. And that's a very important chapter in the history of Auschwitz-Birkenau pretty much from its very beginning. Um, a question which is actually related a little bit to the post-war time period before we return to first thing Grube at the end. Um, Going through those stages of genocide, uh, beyond denial, uh, I'm very convinced that there is one more stage, and the stage is called silence. A silence, a time period in which uh, we are unable or unwilling to talk about it, There's no definitions to talk about it. And we also can see the stage of silence in the history of Gideon, because uh, his music was silent for almost 40 years. It was very hard to get any kind of information about uh, who the person was. And uh, it was very hard to hear his music anywhere. It was only, correct me if I'm wrong, the 80s or the 90s where the first um, snippets of information started to arrive. So uh, can you comment on this uh, time period of silence for, for the story of Gideon and, and the music that he created? Um, Gideon's sister, Lisa, Alishka, she, uh, she was also in, uh, in Auschwitz. She survived. And she made her way back to Prague by some miracle. Um, but if you read about the family, it wouldn't surprise you that these were, were feisty individuals. So she gets back to Prague only to find that Prague is still occupied by the Germans. So she's taken into hiding. And um, she stays in, in Czechoslovakia. Of course, the uh, a, a, a brutal communist regime uh, ends up uh, coming in. And um, she realizes, she, she, she does her best to try and get Gideon's name and his music promoted. All that she's got of the music were some works that he composed in Terezin. And these were rescued by Gideon's girlfriend in Terezin called Irma Semetska, an absolutely remarkable individual. And we owe her this immense debt of gratitude for saving the manuscripts. And she hands them over to Lisa and she does her best to try and promote um, uh, Gideon's music. But of course, Gideon and Lisa being Jewish and being in this, this awful communist regime, you know, the, the two don't work. You know, she, she finds it very challenging to engage scholars and performers uh, outside of Czechoslovakia. Uh, she finds it next, next to impossible to try and get Western scholars and performers into the Czech Republic to perform his, his music uh, and so forth. So to all intents and purposes, there is silence there. And she does her very best under the most difficult situation. And then a very, very curious thing happens. And um, I mean, again, it, it, it's, it's like a, a detective story playing out. Um, there's a family called Herzog and um, they, uh, Mrs. Herzog was, was not Jewish and she stayed in Prague. She wasn't deported. And before Gideon was deported to Terezin, he gave the Herzog family a, a suitcase full of manuscripts, photographs, memorabilia, school reports, you name it. And he said, look after this for when I come back. Of course, he never came back. And the Herzogs reckon that they forgot all about this suitcase and they handed it over to Lisa in 1990. Think about it, 1990, a year after the Velvet Revolution, a year after finally the communist regime tumbles and democracy comes to the Czech Republic. Uh, and then the other manuscripts come to light and Lisa starts the process of getting these works performed, 
and published and, and so on. So the silence is lifted. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, the year in the time period when also the Holocaust memory starts to take shape of being constructed globally. This is the 80s and the 90s. So it's also the time period when all of this research uh, and material is found uh, reaching an audience, which is interesting. Uh, and uh, the last question, and here I'm asking the question, but I'm of course referencing to one specific document, which is your find. Uh, and uh, this is the document I was showing in my film briefly. Uh, this is pretty much the last document that we have uh, that was handwritten by Gideon himself. And that's the letter, uh, which we don't know the date. Can you tell us a few words about the circumstances of this letter being written and what it actually says? So Gideon managed to get a letter smuggled out of First and Gruber. The intermediary who smuggled it out was a prisoner in, in Lager Valbeck, the next door camp. He was a French prisoner called Simon or Simon Pastre, if that was his real name. But uh, his name appears on the letter. And this letter finds its way by some miracle back to Prague. And uh, it finds its way, he addresses it to the non-Jewish non mother-in-law of his sister Edith. Gideon didn't know that Edith by that stage was dead, of course. Uh, and uh, eventually, um, Marie Dolokova was her name. She will have handed it over to Lisa af after the war. But the letter is um, one of the most heartbreaking documents to have been smuggled out of any of the camps, uh, in my opinion. And in it, Gideon asks for us not to forget about him. He asks it three times, do not forget about me. I'm going to read you the letter. And so we haven't forgot about, forgotten about him. And that's why we're here, we're honoring his memory. And that was the message in the letter to me when I first discovered it some years ago. And I thought, well, you know, rest assured Gideon, I'm not going to forget about you. And the letter goes like this. I hope you will receive this message. I'm on work location with many others and we're in great need, especially for bread. I think of you all the time, my dears. Hope you're all together. Don't forget about me. Send parcels with bread, artificial honey, or anything that keeps and is edible. I need it very much. Though I'm not together with family, hopefully Lisa will send a message. What about Eric and the others? I hope they won't forget about me. I need help as fast and often as possible, preferably bread, old underwear, shirts, socks, or anything you can get hold of. Be well and don't forget about me. Send parcels as soon as possible to the sender's address. I hope I will be able to see you soon. Your Gideon. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much for sharing this insight about Gideon and in this way commemorating the anniversary of liberation on the camp. Um, I hope we are going to meet soon, physically. And um, thank you very much for participating in this uh, commemorative program today. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Tomas and David, we are indebted to you for this phenomenal program and insight into Auschwitz and an insight into the life and the dreams and the possibilities and potential of one man, Gideon Klein. You have brought to life his life and we hope together here we will bring honor to his memory. When we were talking about this program, we decided to end with some excerpts from a poem written by Israeli poet Zelda Mishkovsky, Everyone Has a Name. Everyone has a name given to him by God and given to him by his father and his mother. Everyone has a name given to him by his enemies and given to him by his love. Everyone has a name given to him by his celebrations 
and given to him by his work. Everyone has a name given to him by the sea and given to him by his death. Today, according to the Jewish calendar, is Gideon Klein's Yortzeit. May his name and his music be for a blessing and a legacy.